Welcome to Sir Peter Cook, part two. Um, pleased to introduce him uh, to be back. He just escaped the snows of Syracuse via London here. So um, we're, of course, glad to have him for the next three days uh, with our thesis group and undergraduate. And so let's welcome him once again, Sir Peter Cook. Hi, so this is, a, this is a, not a lecture I've tried out before. Um, so you'll see what it's like, I guess. So will I? Um, it's a funny one. It, it, I thought I would show you some things that uh, affect me the one way or the other. And then I thought, actually, I could rationalize that rather than just being stuff out of the pocket. It, I could rationalize it by suggesting that this is the result, subconsciously, I suppose, of a series of procedures uh, or categories of favoritism. And so that's what I'm going to do. The first procedure is to do with childhood. Uh, and the business of maintaining oneself in the psychology of a child I suppose, which I rate rather highly. Now, of course, it could become embarrassing if somebody simply just goes around all the time being silly and childish. I think they would rapidly be eliminated from anybody's uh, address list. But I mean something a bit more than that, which is that there is a very noticeably in one's travels in architecture schools in particular, there's a kind of wonderful innocence that <laughs> occurs to people at, in first year. And then by the time they're in second, third, or fourth year, certainly, their innocence has gone. They become worried. They start <clears throat> looking over their shoulder. They start considering whether what they are doing or what they ought to be thinking uh, is the right thing to be doing. And I say that especially with a group of Columbia students in the audience, because Columbia, I have noticed, is the place where people are most neurotic about whether they're doing the right kind of thing. Welcome to SIARC, where it's a little bit less like that. I hope that's not being over naughty, but it's what I really think. Uh, I was a child at the seaside uh, on several occasions. I was born by the seaside, and of the 10 different towns I lived in as a youth, uh, Three of them were seaside towns. Certainly the one I ended up for the longest time and also went to college in, which is a town called Bournemouth. I show pictures from two of those seaside towns. The one on the left is a rather obscure town called Felixstowe, uh, a, a small seaside town, but with a fun fair at one end. And this was when I didn't really even think about architecture. I wanted to sort of become an architect from about the age of 12, but I think I lived in Felixstowe just before that. And there was this thing on the edge, a, 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 a helter-skelter, such as you're obviously very familiar with, uh, a sort of crazy house made out of, of fake rocks, which I guess you can find, certainly you can find in this city, and some Art Deco, which LA is very good at. I don't say that Felix Stowe was necessarily very good at, at helter-skelters or crazy houses made out of mock rocks or Art Deco, but it was there. And it was sufficiently something that I hadn't come across in the other, in the other eight or so towns that it sort of sank, it somehow went into my memory. I sort of accepted it as architecture. I didn't call it architecture. I probably didn't even know the word at the time. But I accepted it as stuff that you go inside and go up on and look at across the street. By the time I got to Bournemouth, uh, which is where the device on the right hand picture comes from, uh, I was beginning to know that I was interested in architecture. I had lived in towns that had 40 medieval churches. I had lived in towns that had Roman origins. I collected cathedrals like some people collect uh, train spotting. And 
But I was fascinated still, or even more, by the mechanical device. This was the device, it's still there, in fact there are two or three of them, you pay a penny, or you probably now pay about 50 pence, but at that time you paid a penny to go down the hill, down the cliff, and another penny to go up the cliff. Uh, he did it a couple of times, and then you were fairly healthy, and you'd walk both. But, but the, the, the notion, of course, the Victorian device, of a piece of machinery that is integral with the system of the town didn't seem strange. It seemed a very normal occurrence, and it goes into your mental apparatus of, of stuff that's stuff, you know? So early on, stuff architecture can be sort of like a rockery, why not? Or it can be a kind of megastructure, why not? Or it can be decorative, why not? Why not? Why not? Or bits of town can be mechanical, why not? No problem. And, and so I think this is also a project done for the same town of Bournemouth, which is of course one of my sort of known old archigram projects and is lovingly kept in a, in a collection in France and exhibited in many places. It's actually a scrubby drawing, if I look at it. It, it, it used Pentel, which I don't really like as a drawing material. It was done very quickly. And the collage, as, as it was of the period, is kept there by glue. But the idea was that, that such a place, maybe the cliff lift is just off the picture somewhere, uh, such a place could absorb uh, a coming and going piece of city. It could in absorb inflatables. It could absorb things being projected. In other words, the the apparatus of the mobile city was a natural for such a place. After all, you could just see through the pink the, the pier and the device of the, of the seaside pier, as the late Rainer Bannum would describe at great length in discussing Santa Monica Pier, was in a sense the prototypical megastructure. Kids enjoying themselves, uh, your, your leader, who I believe at this moment is in London, uh, that's not the real reason that I came here today, it just was bad planning. But he's one of my favorite kids. I think that what you have is this, this uh, interesting uh, and, and, and highly literary architect, after all, as we know, uh, enjoying himself, enjoying himself into his 60s, still having a good time, and getting his developer to, um, <clears throat> since the name is attached to the building, uh, to also have a good time, and uh, apart from putting Culver City on the map. And I think the achievement of putting, as I've said here before, the achievement of putting Culver City on the map is, is well worth it. But he's a, he's a kid enjoying himself with this tower. Look at the scribbles. Of course he's a kid enjoying himself. So a lovely time. And, uh, you know, why not? Uh, and if you can, if you can make it... Uh, have a client and a pleased client and a client that comes back for more, tongue hanging out hopefully. In fact here, literally the tongues are hanging out, I suspect. Another enthusiasm that I've had and this has been transferred to my wife, through my wife Yael, to our son who's actually studying music is, is the fact that we spend a lot of time listening to music and I always have done. And I go right back again to the same seaside town with the cliff lift also has a very known symphony orchestra. And all the time I lived there, the many years I lived there, I would go to at least one concert, if not two, if there were two in the same week, though I do not play an instrument. But what did weave itself in and out is the fact that I put the headphones on nearly always when I'm working, if I'm drawing, and have done. And I use, I use music uh, selfishly I put music that I know and enjoy and can almost sing along with, uh, though it might be to the outside world relatively complex music. There's a whole discussion which I could go off into, which is that after you get to about Scriabin, uh, it becomes difficult to concentrate on the music and to draw as well, so that the tendency is to use music in which I wallow. And I realize that my predilection for heavily scored late 19th century, early 20th century music is because that's the sort of architecture I make. I could discuss that at greater length, but I simply throw out the clues. The other thing that has fascinated me, though I haven't really arrived at any very cogent theory of it, is, is that, that if, you, if you look at musical scoring, particularly, again, 19th century romantic or, or mid-20th century 
uh, symphonic scoring, there are a lot of analogies with urban design. There are a lot of conditions of the use of counterpoint, the use of sort of underbelly, uh, the use of, 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 of counter themes and crescendos and diminuendos and pacing, which is all the sort of stuff that you could apply to urbanism if you wish to. Um, but I'm not a musician and I'm not a qualified urbanist, but, but I have more than a sniff about this. And it's perhaps a post-rationalization of the fact that I enjoy listening to the stuff. And there must be something in it that when I put on certain pieces of music, the, stu the, the work I do gets better. And if I hear irritating music in the background, I, get, I, I slow down and, and get tetchy. So this is a continuation of the theme of, of uh, childhood, if you will. And, and I don't know whether in American English you use the word daft. Do you use it? I suspect not as much as we do. Oh, he's daft. The lad's daft. He's daft. A daft idiot. I haven't heard that in, but I guess you know it, what it means. But I'm, of course, being a good boy and saying being usefully daft, which is the difference. From, um, there is this... Uh, old, long dead English uh, cartoonist, name and address supplied, I blank, ain't having a, sorry? Heath Robinson. Heath, thank you. Heath Robinson. Uh, my friend CJ Lim is a big Heath Robinson fan. We, we, we try and out by each other as to how many Heath Robinson references we can make. But the, the main thing about Heath Robinson's invention were that they were very much part of our culture, I think, of silly things that are, that are inventive, but nobody's ever going to do them. Things involving uh, musical instruments, bits of beds, uh, games equipment, and and... You know, some of the things, if you start looking at it, they're almost viable. And I like to think that the, the, the world of, of improvisation, and we were just upstairs looking at the robots, talking about a man called Gordon Pask, who was very much coming out of this sort of, what can we do with three pieces of wire, and it ends up being a, a water-powered water computer kind of background. And I think it's, 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 I suppose if you wanted to be pompous about it, you could say it would be sort of, creative speculation, or taking on where the doodle leaves off. Uh, there's another wonderful old guy, well, I'm an old guy myself, he's a really old guy, uh, uh, called Pancho Geddes, Amancio Geddes, who's still alive. He built 400 buildings in, in, in um, what was then the Mozambique, and then uh, left, and is eventually ended his, ending his days back in Portugal. He draws drawings like this. This is meant to be an illustration of what goes on in one of his buildings. Uh, and the, the orange part is pretty much a, a, a facsimile. He's a, he's a very fascinating architect. And then he, he draws these cartoons. Instead of putting you know, the position of the bed in the bedroom, he puts two people sort of lying horizontally, etc. So you, you get the picture. But it's, it's a guy sort of, in, in the best sense of the word, playing with himself. He's playing, he is both extremely wise and sometimes even autocratic, but also childlike. And he has played upon his childlike qualities. He makes pottery as well as buildings and drawings uh, as well as artifacts. Now, honestly, I suppose this ought to be more serious, but, but the reason I put it in this piece is that it's a, another haunting, haunting person. Uh, way back in Germany, way back in the 1920s, I think. And he appears in various of the publications of, of, of such things as Frühlicht, which was the uh, publication of Bruno Taut, which was a big influence upon archigram at a certain moment. We were, we were avidly looking at what, what little we could lay hands on from Prolicht at the recommendation of Peter Rayner Bannon. And we did, as some of you may know, the fourth issue of archigram, which was the one with the pop-up page in it. But the fourth issue also celebrated the connectivity between 
a, the, the sort of Bruno Tart tradition, and that of the American comics, of the American comics. And we were able to find a number of illustrations from mostly 1940s and 1950s American comics which looked uncannily similar to Carl Kreil's drawings. And yet all we can find out in the, in the uh, biographies is that Carl Kreil was a sort of illustrator, possibly an architect, we're not quite sure, uh, one of Bruno Tartt's circle, but not one of the, the circle who eventually went on to do buildings. He seems to have begun and ended doing very particular drawings. But there are man mannerisms of his drawings which are so strangely similar that all we can imagine is that, that, that there was somebody sitting out there in the Rhode Island School of Design or somewhere seeing this stuff and transfers or saying that is what a modern city means. Was, did somebody get hold of a copy of the Frulich magazine? Was it sitting there? I, I think that RISD is a, a key because uh, it is known that the office block, that it, the old office block that faces the RISD uh, Art and Architecture School was used in very, it was as the first sort of Superman skyscraper. So I'd like to think that it was RISD that, that this was going on. Uh, anyhow, we cottoned on to this in the late 60s when we were doing Archigram, or the mid 60s, doing Archigram. And Warren, Warren Chalk, who, who, who I, together with, we collected these comics. And, sifted through them, neither of us could quite figure out where the connection was made, but it must have been made. We, one's belief is that stuff doesn't come from under a stone. And so one's, one of one's fascinations is to try and trace odd byways of, of architectural creative culture. Some of the byways, of course, are much better documented. I have managed by, by virtue of making excuses to go into the area to go and see what Zaha Hadid has done. And on the same day then gone across from Wolfsburg to, to Hanover to see the reconstruction of, of Schwitter's Mertzbau. Now, Zaha of course does big buildings and the Mertzbau is a very small room. I do not wish to be disrespectful of which sits in the memory the longer uh, or which I consider to be the more innovative in its way. Uh, Schwitter's, of course, ended in poverty in the north of England. Uh, Zaha is flourishing. But I think we should not, we should not forget the, the lines of connectivity that go between the weird, the childish, the inventive, and the more publicized territories of invention. And Schwitter's was an extraordinary collagist, including the funny I mean, at first sight, you say, yes, it's a nice piece of this, but uh, delicate and, and, and uh, full of patina and so on. And then you suddenly see the kind of funny little figure of Father Christmas or somebody holding their head. That inconsistency is also a very important constituent of, of, of the highly creative. Deliberate, dare I say, even naughty, perverse inconsistency, the insertion of the one thing. You take the little... Father Christmas art, I'm trying to, I don't know if it is Father Christmas, but did you take, you take him out, and you'd have a very nice, uh, well, well uh, balanced art piece. But you put him in, and it suddenly calls question to the whole of the rest. And I think you've got to be really, really good to, to do that. Or one goes nearer to home, to Las Vegas, and it's, it's, it's enjoyable to be put into that toy town world, uh, albeit the toy town is there to make money, but it's, it's, it's to, to confront uh, heroic Americana, which is what this is at, what is it, half scale, three quarter scale, fifth scale, I can't remember, but maybe it's not even properly to scale, but to have New York on one side of the road and Paris on the other side of the road and Venice around the corner, uh, is, is either something which you pretend you haven't noticed if you're very uptight uh, or, you, or you want to look at more and say, actually, what a great idea. Why bother to go to all those places? Some of them are pretty boring anyway. But why not just have them? 
uh, with, with, with uh, uh, you know, sunshine and a monorail thrown in. Uh, I, I, at first when I saw it, I didn't know whether to laugh or cry. And now I find myself adoring it. I think it's a great way to deal with, with, with uh, culture. You know, stick it, stick it up in polystyrene and leave it there and pay money to go inside it. Uh, I'm not sure whether what reality is really about, you see. And you might say, well, this is a toy too, except that, of course, because Toyoito is a significant person, because it was a very clever toy, because in a way it anticipates, you know, the number of, of rip-offs of this project I've seen uh, coming from student projects is, 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 is more than would fill a page. But it is, and it is very, you know, people who don't like that, I don't really want sort of robotics and, and things that go click in the night to affect architecture, say, oh, it's terribly small. I've, I've noticed, I've noticed that people who don't like something in architecture, if they're forced to comment, say it's very small, or the drawing wasn't very well done, or the computer program uses a very primitive one. And they always think of something which is what they're really saying is, I don't like that kind of thing, it, it threatens me. But they will use the fact that it's very small. It is very small, true, but it's great, and it was way ahead of its time. I personally think that Toyo Ito is still, of his generation, perhaps of several generations, the most interesting architect I know because he suddenly catches you unawares. Every four or five years, he does something that carries the state of the art forward. Uh, and nice guy as well, but that's, by the way. Uh, since we are in Japan, people playing... I was lucky enough, I may have shown this to you before, I can't remember, but uh, uh, did I show it to you last time? No, that's all right. Um, finally, Yael and I went there, and, and um, Fujimori took us. He, it's, it's actually what he doesn't, what is not said in the, in the Biennale thing, is it's across the street from his mum. His mum lives one side of the street, and uh, I think his dad is still alive too. Uh, we, we met his mum, and she gave, gives you tea, and then you go across the street and look at the funny house. Uh, that, I'd rather like things like that, because he's actually, maybe he'd always wanted to have a tree house there. He waits till he's sort of well into his 50s or something and builds one. You see, most, most people, by the time they be, become an official professor of architectural history and culture uh, and get into their 50s, they, they're, they're, they're too nervous. You see, I think most of you from Columbia would be far too nervous to, to, to do something that you really liked. Uh, whereas, in my view, it, great, great on Fujimori, and then people like it and like it and like it, and other people like it, and they say, do more, do more, and he goes and does another one uh, in, you know, for the official museum of the, of, the, of the town down the road. And he's doing more, and then everybody gets wound up, and he does one in London, and he'll probably do one for Sayak if you ask him. You know, why? Well, I quite imagine him doing one for Sayak. Uh, perhaps the first one that's computer generated, who knows? And, and I think that, that, that I, I make a creed occur for remaining childlike if that's what that stuff I've just been showing you means. There are other things, though, that stay deep in one's memory. I repeatedly and repeatedly and repeatedly show this picture, which when I got to Bournemouth but hadn't yet gone to the architecture school, I found, I, I dug out every book on architecture I could from the public library. It was in the days when people used public libraries, as you remember. And I, uh, I lived in towns, as I said, with medieval churches. I'd done Bolsterwood models of cathedrals. I, I got into modern. And I got into the sort of horizontal strip window modern. I knew what that was, sort of. That was modern. And then I saw this picture, and it's still, and I'm not bullshitting, it really, it, it absolutely staggered me. I'd never seen anything in any of the towns I'd lived in that remotely looked like this, which looked like an aeroplane. It looked as if it wanted to take off and sail. It had this extraordinary lightness and fragile and wonderful curves and fragility. It was, of course, pulled, on, it pulled down before I was born. I might be the oldest person in the room, I don't know, but 
that's even older. That was pulled down in 1930. And I've only ever seen it in black and white photographs. I've seen colored watercolors of it as a proposal. So I don't think they had, well, they had color. For it. So all we know, all I know, is this view and a couple of other views in black and white photographs. And of course, I've knocked around a bit since, since then. It's possible that if I'd actually seen it in real, it might have been bulkier or heavier or darker than it appears to be in this photograph. Well, that's a pretty reasonable photograph. The point is, that's how I saw it, and that was its impact, and it suggested to me that architecture could be much more than these solid objects that, that surround me. And that is still my view, and I'm still using this photograph. I'm still having to use this photograph to make the point that if they, for God's sake, if they could do that in 1930, why are we pissing around? <laughs> On the other hand, there are other weird buildings that have stayed in the memory, memory just because they are so, so weird. Uh, and I was able to visit it uh, some years ago in Norman, Oklahoma, and it is as spooky as it looks in the picture and had a spooky person living in it. And uh, it gets very spooky inside. Uh, I, 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 I hope nobody's a relative of his sitting here, but the architect, later we got to come and give a lecture in London, and he was not as interesting as the house. That sometimes happens. I was quite surprised. He was a bit sort of homespun for my taste, but I heard Green's he, brilliant that he did this. And you expected him to be something out of the Adams family. And he wasn't. He was a sort of down home guy with a tweed jacket. You know. um, on the other hand, another project which I returned to, and of course isn't reality, it's not sitting out there in, in, in a prairie or anywhere is Hans Hollein's uh, aircraft carrier on the Burgenland hills in Austria. The notion of the total mechanized, out of context city in a single building. And there has been a kind of syndrome, I suppose, if I post-rationalize afterwards, I can say, look, Ron Heron's walking city, and look, Le Cabouze's unité d'adaptation are also the notion of the total city taken out and put in a great big structure. But the Holine one, because of its absurdity, because of the very creative cynicism that, that Holine as a personality is able to put into it, is very special. And I think Holine is, an, it, by, I digress again, uh, Holine is an interesting person in that he, he's one of the people who makes me feel so s most scared in his company, and I've known the guy for 45 years. I still find him sort of scary, gloomy. And then you have to sort of brace yourself and say, I know he's looking at me in a funny way and he's scary, gloomy, and he's Austrian, but let's keep the conversation going. And then he cheers up, and he's still, and he's older than me, he still gives some of the most cute lectures that, that, that one can go to. Another project that, that stuck in one's memory uh, was this piece of, of New Babylon by Constant. Uh, the historians, of course, are always discussing uh, archigram in relation to uh, the Constant group. Situationists. Uh, I think the historians probably prefer the situationists because they were more political. I think the historians enjoy to tweak us with the uh, example of the situationists, although I, my informants tell me that actually Constant Neuenhuis was actually booted out of the situationists because he started enjoying doing stuff too much. And the hard-line situationists, the Debords and others, uh, wanted it still to keep very, very theoretical. I can, I can report to you that there was a moment in London in the 1960s when Michael Webb and I went 
to the Institute of Contemporary Arts and we sat and we listened to a lecture by Constant. And he had amazing slides. What is interesting, though he came from a more politically correct position, he had the most sumptuous slides. He had the most expensive, big format slides. And Mike and I actually, not so much dealing with the, with the political theory of it, we were, just, we were just salivating because he had better slides than we did. We said, bugger, the guy's got really, really good slides. That was I crashing. We went home and said, how can we get better slides? Who's got a good camera? I mean, I said, it sounds really banal, but it was actually so. It's not the official response of Archigram to the uh, situation. It says, fuck them, they've got really good slides. Uh, this is not a good slide, because it's a scan taken by me out of a black and white book. But um, it was an extraordinary, extraordinary object that stays in the memory. Other things stay in the memory that one actually experiences as places. Now, I'm probably speaking on dangerous ground here because after all you have you have your hero and I, my hero certainly Frank Gehry and the wonderful Disney concert hall and having visited his studio many times during the extremely long drawn out genesis of, of the Disney concert hall one knows so many stories about it and yes the acoustics are okay and all of that but still for me dare I say it in this city the definitive concert hall is the Philharmonie in Berlin. Um, and one has tested it. And I'm, Yell and I have sat there in several different parts of the hall to see whether it really does work. Well, not just the, the tickets we got, but <laughs> one has sat in a number of different positions in the hall, and it works every time. And is an extraordinarily stunning piece of, of inventive but also functioning architecture. Um, and Sharoon gets better with time, I think. Sometimes one's memory of things is of actually your own work. This is probably the first uh, piece of uh, project that, that Gavin Robotham, who is now my working partner, and I did together. Gavin was part of a group of four of us, myself, Christine Hawley, C.J. Lim, and Gavin, who did a series of competitions, one after the other, two of which were successful. Um, but this was, the, this was the piece that got away. Uh, that somebody else built the building, and this is still a favorite piece of mine. Uh, there are two features of the building that we used as, as uh, totems. One was a, a piece called the beaver, and that's not seen on, from this elevation. It's actually a, a, an object sitting on the other side of the building, which about halfway through the design, the forest was working on it. We said, bloody hell, it looks like a beaver. And once we started calling it a beaver, we couldn't get away from calling it. And the bit on the top right-hand side, somebody said, God, it looks like a fried egg. And indeed it did. And so we were then in the next sort of two weeks of, the, of developing the project, we would keep referring to things as sort of 15 meters left of the beaver or, or two meters up above the fried egg or below the fried egg. And, and they became references inside. I was in Canada, as one sometimes is, wrong time of year. And uh, I, was, I gave a lecture, and this was a hot, project at the time. This was a new project and I showed it and I described the beaver. A very kind member of the audience, before I'd finished the lecture, had gone across the street and bought me a beaver in a tin. It's one of those tinned animals that you press the top and the animal comes out. It now resides in our son's collection of 300 soft toys. Uh, I think I like giving lab one of my terrible habits is to give labels to things. Once the plug-in city was the plug-in city. It had to be the plug-in city. Once a project for Hampstead uh, where water is used, it became inevitably Dampstead. And once I called it Dampstead, it made it easier to continue with it. Sometimes, we, now that this is known as a process, uh, we don't always have a beaver or a fried egg to work off. Uh, I sometimes have to artificially give things Everybody in the office says, give it a title, give it a title. You'll find a title, and then we'll know what to say it's about. 
I just blank out. I can't think of anything. It's just something that starts on the northeast corner. I think this is something. I have spent most of my academic career teaching older students, that is to say, end of diploma or postgraduates, very, very rarely younger students. And I inevitably, amongst those who I continue to talk to, uh, get asked, what should I do next? What city should I move to? What office should I go to? And then they always apply to Zaha or Foster anyway, but they never take your advice. But, but they sometimes do. The intelligence ones do. And they say, what should I do? And the real answer is, I suppose, is it a cynic's answer or is it a sociologist's answer? Or some a, a cynical amateur sociologist who's processed several thousands of students. Is it's who you hang out with, what actually matters to how you progress in the years after the hand-holding that is represented by the university. It's who you hang out with. I hang out, as you well know, with the lady on the right, who is my second wife and who is my severest critic. We don't work together because she's a late night person. I'm an early morning person. Uh, therefore, our relationship has survived for 23 years and continues to survive. Uh, whereas I suspect, had we actually tried to set up in business together, uh, we'd have been in the divorce courts long ago. Uh, Gavin Robottom, who spent a happy three months once as a, an exchange student here, uh, he is the, 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 the R of Crab, and he is a, one of my first Bartlett students. Um, and as I say, we, we, we didn't get together as an office until we'd we done several competitions together. And these are the two people I listen to the most. Uh, I know that they mean no ill, and I also know that they're fundamentally extraordinarily encouraging, and I, I get a buzz from them, even though they've been around for quite a lot of time. That is important. I'm lucky in this respect. And then we have a, uh, there's the endless extended family. This happens to be Sri Hecker, who's somebody I probably see once every 15, 18 months somewhere. This is probably, probably Berlin. And uh, he often, I also like the fact that he often has a hand gesture. There are two separate occasions on the same day with the hand gesture. And I had four more pictures of Svi with a hand gesture. That is how, it, it says, and, and you can almost hear his voice saying, don't you see? Don't you realize? Don't you know? It's just sort of, it's more than just sort of sitting there as an English person. Saying, oh, I don't, I'm really, my, my opinion is this. So it's, 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 <coughs> You know, this is this is a, all there's Lebius, a wonderful, wonderful guy, who, with his low, grating, Midwestern voice, and the wine, not far off picture, graveling the moralist amongst us, I think, uh, losing. Uh, Raymond Abraham was one thing. Uh, if we lose Leb, it will be, I think, even greater thing. He's hanging on in there, but uh, he's somebody that one does travel across the Atlantic to see. And of course, there are people now dead, and, and one enjoyed all that time back when one put together magazines. This is not from the famous archigram. This is for a bit later magazine I had when I had a gallery called Artnet, and we put together about four issues of a thing called Net. It, in, it, it amused me to combine two phenomena from different places and almost uh, to, 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 to have an imaginary confrontation of, of Colin Rowe with Ludwig Leo's Umlauf tank in Berlin. Uh, I don't know what he would have had to say about it or what Ludwig Leo would have had to say to him, but it amused me at the time to say these two phenomena are precious and special. And certainly if we're talking about who you hang out with, there were enormous numbers of both British and American architects who would hang on the very, liter almost literally hang on the coat, I mean almost physically hang on the coattails of Colin Rowe. Whether that did him a lot of good, I'm not sure, because there is the obverse side of, of, of friendship, which is, is, is I think that 
it works better amongst equals. And if I show, first of all, Yell and Gavin, it's because I regard them as totally intellectually or creatively my equals. I don't think there's this sort of coattail syndrome, though they are younger than me. And out of that inevitably comes the question of eating and drinking. Quite how uh, Dottori over here in the corner manages without alcohol, I've never understood, but he manages rather well. Uh, clearly the cigar has qualities which uh, I didn't realize existed. If you go to a certain cafe in the western part of Los Angeles, by accident you will come across people such as the group of gentlemen in the, in the distance there. Uh, I didn't go into that restaurant that morning. I did happen to have a camera with me. I've learned to nearly always have a camera with me. I, I didn't think they would be there. There was nothing to suggest that they should be there, except, of course, that's where they were. Uh, and it's a, 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 rest, a cafe that's existed many times uh, on the border of Santa Monica with Venice, and you know where I mean. Uh, on the other hand, here's a very typically funny old English situation, much more, re re very recent. We found ourselves in my old hometown, my seaside town, in which my architecture college, which had, show, which had closed for many years, uh, is now reconstituted and has become a fancy university called the Bournemouth Arts University. And this was an event where we, as a, as a office did the first show to celebrate their new status. And there's a group of people around the table, some of whom may even be recognizable there. In bright red is Mike Davis. He is the architect of the, the dome in London. The, 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 he, he was partner of, of Rogers, and he did many of the key high-tech buildings, the dome and, and various of the metal buildings with arms hanging out and so on. And he always wears red. He has a red Jaguar. He buys his shoes from Los Angeles where the cobbler around the corner here holds five pairs of red shoes ready for Mike to pass through. He was at UCLA at a certain time. And there were a number of other quite prominent uh, architects sitting around the table who'd come down for the occasion. But the room we're sitting in is, 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 is a typical funny, funky, phony English thing. The room is a stateroom from the ship Mauritania, which was a ship of the early part of the 20th century, which was, when it was broken up, some nutcase bought a large piece of the Mauritania, took it down to this place, Pool Harbor, and built a house around it. The entire house was built in order to be the frame for the stage set, which is the interior of the Mauritania. So there you get a series of progressive or quasi-progressive architects sitting in a recreated bit of ship brought up onto dry land by a harbor. And I like things like that because there's a certain, there's, it, the whole thing is either phony or authentic, generic or totally not generic, depending on what you think that all these people had descended down to this corner of southern England to celebrate something, but then celebrated it in a lost piece of, of naval art. But coming together to eat or drink is, is a very important thing. I think one of the reasons why we enjoy having our studio where we have it is that because there's this whole series of tents and cabins that arrive at lunchtime. It's an old marketplace, and they use it. And a very large part of the architectural population of London, because of the offices grouped around that area, Zaha, Grimshaw, many others, including ourselves, are grouped around this area. And people meet people that they were at college with, even if that means Zurich or Cincinnati, because they're all coming out for the cheap lunches in the tents. That's something which I think we don't, you know, it's one thing to say, yes, fancy bourgeois architects will go to a certain sort of restaurant after the lecture. But there's another thing is where you actually hang out that day. Since I'm a bit of a foodie, this is a, this is a, a Peter Cook in his black-haired period. Uh, 
in Berlin, somewhere around the 1980s, I think, uh, at a special design event where six of us were rounded up and paid for by Alessi to produce projects to do with food and drink. And I rhetorically chose the fish and chip tradition, including the newspaper that, that in, when I was a child, you could buy fish and chips in the newspaper and something like the Daily Mirror would be sort of printed onto the, onto the batter of the thing. Of course, that was then ruled to be totally unhygienic. And now when you buy fish and chips, it's in a sort of boring, faceless, plastic, styrene pot. But that time I was being more, I was trying to be more English than the English. You note the waistcoat, the bow tie, the fish and chips, the packet, and a quote, and, and a piece of Daily Mirror on the, on the drawing. God knows what the Germans and their, their Italian paymasters made of it, but uh, clearly it was a post-rational. Or food as a celebratory event. This is the occasion of Zaha's 60th birthday, about five months ago, uh, where she commandeered the Burlington Arcade, which is a very beautiful, long, 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 long arcade. Um, and the, the longest table I have seen, which ran the length of the arcade, and all her friends and whoever they all were from every part of the country and every part of the world, actually, flew in. And so there is the, the business of the food event seen as an excuse. Uh, it's very central to architecture, I think. This. Or perhaps more correctly, drawing. Very rare occasion when Yell and I were caught drawing at the same time, which was in Tokyo. We had to try and finish the drawing quickly, and Yell joined in, and then all sorts of other people joined in. We still didn't quite finish the drawing. Uh, I think one of the past masters of drawing of my immediate circle uh, is, is C.J. Lim, who took drawing. Now he has proper projects to do. He's probably doing much less drawing. But he took drawing to the point at which he exploded the art of drawing itself. The drawing started to sprout into becoming three-dimensional objects and started taking off from the page by, by pieces of paper taking off from the page and then actually three 3D objects that took off from the paper which itself took off from the page and then the page still had paper on it. I think this sort of territory fascinates me because I've never regarded drawing as a separated art. It's simply part of the process, whatever we mean by drawing. And occasionally one lurches into using watercolor because it's quick and it can be very precisely colored. Although this was actually not intended as an art piece by me, it was intended as an instruction for the people in Vienna to know what color we were really trying to get things to be. Or famous drawings of the past um, and this is the drawing of, of, the, uh, of the Hearst factory in, in uh, Hearst, actually, in, in Frankfurt, the inside of which gets near and is a wonderful coloration. But did the drawing get nearer? That's the intriguing question. Or well, here is a drawing of something that I find scary and frightening. Those of you who know my book uh, remember, will remember that I use this illustration. And it's done by a guy called Miroslav Sik, who I have never met. But people who know him in Zurich say that he's the most extremely depressed Czechoslovak. And he is like his drawings. And he's a sort of whether well, he's a neo-fascist, but there are overtones about this project which I find extremely, extremely spooky. And certainly I've seen student projects from his studio which appear to be almost more Third Reich than Third Reich. I mean, they look like, they look like concentration camps. There are many strange aspects. Uh, but I'm fascinated. I, I cannot avoid 
a, a creepy fascination I have for them. I suppose I secretly do want to meet the guy, see if he's actually as awful as he sounds he is. And apparently when we asked permission to reproduce, he was most surprised that somebody like me would be using his drawing. We are, we are sort of enemies without having ever met. Uh, or there are the, the drawings of, of Bruno Tart. Oh, I should have said that the Hearst building is Peter Behrens, by the way. Uh, the, 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 the drawings of Tart and the scribblings of Tart and the writings of Tart, we're back to Frühlicht again, uh, because that interest in whether Karl Kreil was the origin point of, of the Chicago comics, whether the question of the drawn can push you further than the reality. And there are certain things that one draws which, uh, in which making an illustrative drawing covers so much territory. This, I have, this was never built, as you probably realize, but the model exists. I think this shows more than the model. It's curious, it was this model I spent a lot of time on, but this shows more because one's able to go into almost, almost a, a pedantic detail in parts and sort of just emblemic quality in the other. And I think that sometimes um, some computer-produced drawings have it all. If you do your own painful hand drawing, you can exclude. Sometimes you have to exclude because you don't know how to draw the, <laughs> draw the sheen. If I was asked to draw the sheen on this, this red object, I would find it extremely difficult. I can then say, the sheen is not important. What is important is the statement of it. And get away with murder, you see. Um, and um, I think there is certain, you know, the, the, the vegetation can be played or played down. The, the, the blueness of the pool of the swing can be played up or played down. Um, and I think it, it, one can have different kinds of quality. Or, of course, this which is produced by computers can ape the old cutaway drawing. Sometimes I think that there was a marvelous period of, of us borrowing from those cutaway drawings of, of, uh, of ships or airplane engines or, 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 you know, how cathedrals were built, those sort of things. We cut it away and you see all these. And, and, and sometimes we've maintained that because a cutaway drawing can show much more than the completed volumetric object. What is really interesting about this theatre scheme, which we, it's nearly three years now since we won the competition, it's Italy, we see no sight of it happening. But that's probably more to do with Italy than to do with us. Um, and I think that um, it, can, it can show many, you can select, the business of selecting and not necessarily showing everything, I think it's terribly important. Or oh, here's, a, here's a funny little drawing that I sort of found it sort of got lost from the oeuvre. This is a building, of course, that we're building and for which many, many necessary drawings have been made and a certain number of kind of quote-unquote presentation drawings. I say drawings, they're, they're all computer drawings. And this one, which was, I can't even remember quite why we did it. It was to demonstrate something about the louvers, but it ended up it looking more like one of those sort of 1910 solid objects because of the monochrome quality of it and because of the, the, the greater degree of solidity of the louvered part than actually is intended. So that is curious. And I just suddenly remember there's another aspect of this one. If you look at the roof of the hotel on the left, it, it, it's almost getting to that sort of Heath Robinson quality of detail, whereas the red object is seen just as a bulk. Um, the business of discrimination, or occasionally one just does a scribble. This was a scribble I did uh, at the presentation of a project for a competition in Madrid. Uh, we were successful in the competition, and then the stock market in Madrid dropped, I think, 10 days later. It will never see the light of day. But we'd done the full Monty of, of regular computer projections, drawings, plans, sections, you name it. And then I did this drawing for the jury. I said, well, it's sort of like this. And suddenly I saw them sort of take it, it somehow it, it jumped across. I, I don't think it's a, a great drawing. It's just sometimes 
that even the physical involvement of being seen to say, well, it's sort of like this. Rather like I used, as I showed you last time, the cartoons in Australia, which I can also report that we've got the go-ahead, we've got a guy already on site, they're going to start digging in four months' time, it's scary, we're down there, we've got it, we're doing it, we're waiting for the check. <laughs> uh, lucky enough to travel, one takes oneself with you, and I think the other thing, apart from my recommendation to older or younger students, it matters who you hang out with. It matters tremendously who you hang out with. That is the most important thing, almost more than going to a fancy college. The second most important thing is to keep looking. Admittedly, you look selectively, but keep looking. I have the advantage, dare I say it in Los Angeles, of not being able to drive. I'm a pain in the ass to everybody who knows me, but I have spent years looking out of the window. Somebody's watching the lights. I said, ah, oh, that's rather good. Oh, uh, yes, isn't that good over there? And, yes. And they drive nervously on. Oh, that was rather good. Oh, I'll get the camera out. Uh, it's, a, it's a great luxury. Uh, one goes selectively to look at places. This is Yell, and me photographing her photographing uh, in Eric's office. And you can see the tower probably about three years ago two years ago, or going to one of our favorite buildings, happening to be in Berlin for a couple of days, going early in the morning to the, Sch the Schabrunner and looking at it again and to see what state it's in now and whether it still works to us. And we said, bloody hell, that is such a good building. It really does work. You can see diagrams of it. You can see photos of it. You can see explanations of it. You can have discussions about its significance in Eric Mendelssohn's work. If you're there, you're there, and you see that a certain size of circle is effective, and across the street there's a smaller size of circle which is less effective. And it's almost impossible to do that without seeing. Or to go to Potsdam, just down the road, from there and see the substance of this building. You know, because you've seen the drawings, that it was actually knocked up in steel and brick and God knows what, and then plastered over. And again, it's right like the boring people who say it's very small. They say, oh, it's very small. I, the first I heard of the, 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 the Mendelssohn Tower by those po-faced people, it's very small. Okay, it's small, but it's not that small. I mean, if you like it, it doesn't, care, it doesn't matter that it's small, but it doesn't, it's small. I'm beware of people who say something is small. And then there are things around the corner from the stuff you have gone to see, which if you sort of you photograph it and you look at it, probably even this, it was just I sort of took a few photographs around the zoo station because I'm staying around the corner and why not. I look at this after, I say, God, that was a pretty interesting, funny little old thing. Look at those. Where did James Sterling get those columns for his late work out in the, in the hills near, uh, wherever it is, Middle Germany, uh, Castle? Where did he get them? Ha, 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 ha. Jim was using that station. Of course he was. Yeah, nice one, Jim. But, and, and that sort of tilted roof that we've all done except here it's early days, so it's a bit thick. But it's not a bad piece of funny stuff. And that goes in the back pocket. I'm not saying it's significant. It's not in my categorical notice of things I remember for a long time. But it's, 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 you have to go there and you realize it's all right. Or to go actually to see something that you've been told a lot about, you've seen in lectures, you know the guy, he takes you there. And my God, Tezuka's deck on his school is wonderful. But it's wonderful not only because of sociological issues contained within the school and the notion of the circle, which isn't quite a true circle. You think it's a circle, but it's not quite a circle. But because it's a wonderful, extraordinary deck for, for somebody like me who's an enthusiast for the boardwalk, you have to see Tezuka's boardwalk, and then you say, wow, this is what really a boardwalk could be. It is a, the building is all about that boardwalk. Then you find yourself in a funny place. I was in Bordeaux a year or so ago, 
in, a, in a strange conference in a tent, which was all very arty and sociological and sort of, you know, in a French kind of way. And I, I had about an hour and a half to kill. And the weather wasn't too bad. I just went out with the camera. And there was some stuff that people do photograph in Bordeaux, and I've been taken to see on another occasion, you know, Rem's house and the Corbusier stuff and so on. But I was just wandering around the town, and I saw this funny tower. Now, this, from this photograph, you, can, you see the tower. In fact, when you're there, the tower is about twice the height of the, the office bit underneath it. And it, it's a strange thing, and you wonder what it's all about. And it's the gas company uh, headquarters, but I've been trying on the internet in the last few days because I, I, I thought, I'll show you that Bordeaux thing because it's one of those funny things. I have no idea who the architect is. I have no idea what date it was done. If I was pushed to the wall, I'd put the date 1950 on it, but it could have been, could have just about been late 30s. I think it would be 50s, but I'm not sure. Don't know who the guy is. Can't find out who the guy is. Anybody sitting here from Bordeaux, I'll give them a, a glass of scotch if they can tell me who did it. Uh, and, and then you go to places where you know you're going to be stimulated. I've been going back and back every time to Shibuya in Tokyo because it is, it is a, it's an assault upon the system, and yet it's sort of rather good. Some of the buildings, we're supposed to say they're terrible, right? We're trained to say they're terrible. But actually, look hard. They, they do what they're doing rather wittily, some of them. Looking out the back is something you find you do if you have a, a lady wife who needs to be in the bathroom for a while and you're itching to get down and have some fish and chips. You look out the back window. You're in Norwich, England, and if you look out the back window of this particular place in Norwich, you start noticing, you take a photo and you start noticing things. And you think, ah, there's not another street until nearly the back of the picture. The next street is actually way, way there. There's lots of stuff in between. In Germany, they would call them Hof houses, but there's no Hof for the houses to be in. They're just little, it's like a little building in of stuff in between the one street and the next. The street in the front is, George, is genuine Georgian street. It's a sort of proper architecture street, but the back, it all hangs out. It's an essay in how to do roof lights in damp Norfolk. It's an essay into how, have, how many different kinds of pitch roof can you have and keep the urban grain. It's an essay in the fact that places like Norwich have a very high proportion of vegetation. The front of the street is more elegant with a piece of, 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 of Neo-Swedish at the end of it, which is the city hall. But the back is more fascinating. Norwich also has, has these contrived places where you look, you are controlled before you see. Quite, quite heavy architecturally, this particular Georgian building on the right, medieval gate in the middle. Or this, sorry about the slide, it's actually, it's, it, I've homed in on a detail of a picture, my favorite door in Scandinavia is this of the, of the uh, hotel in the center of Copenhagen by an architect called Rosen. I managed to find in a used bookstore a, a, a book about his architecture. And, and this is the Palace Hotel, Copenhagen. And look at that doorway. Who makes an opening for a door and then pokes the tongue out. It's a double trouble, but it's a brilliant door. It is a fucking marvelous door. I'm, it's my favorite door. I, I'll promise you next, well, I, no, I have to go through Copenhagen next week, but quickly. Uh, when I'm there for more than five minutes, I will go back and take a proper photograph because I love that doorway. The, 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 the Scandinavians can be spooks when they want to be. Uh, there's the door, there's another of the doorways to Norwich Cathedral on the left, we're back to Norwich. And then finally, when you get through the door, there is a magnificent building, which if you remember that it was in the 10th century, uh, it was pretty far out. Uh, and there is the building in its context with the neo, 
It's the neo-Swedish uh, building, the town hall behind. And, and what is interesting about towns like Norwich, and this is really in my background, because I'm originally an English provincial and did live in this town at the time when I made the Balsamwood Cathedral. Uh, the variety of typologies is enormous. That, the castle, is actually a, a refurb. The, there's an old Norman castle inside, and then the Victorians sort of coated it with what they thought castles ought to look like. So it's phony, original interior phony. But this is, all, this is one of the 40 medieval churches. They're all over. That was a very difficult task. A, a famous 19th century architect called one of, one of the Gilbert Scott family was commissioned to do the Catholic cathedral in a Protestant city, which already had this very famous cathedral. Nasty one, that. Imagine you won the competition, which I think you did, to do something where there is a heroic, better one down the road. A, everybody is going to be constantly comparing what you did. It's like having the famous father, but worse. They're going to be comparing whatever you do with this. And even though he's a pretty bloody good guy, it's a no, no winner. It sits there saying, hello, I'm, I'm big too and I'm Catholic to boot, but it doesn't help, really. It's not bad a building, actually. If this wasn't there, you'd say, that's a really good uh, uh, no." near Gothic building up there, but nobody ever, nobody ever mentions it. But there's a lot of stuff. And the other thing is, of course, the greenery. The percolation of greenery is very important. And, and yesterday, I left this place. In fact, this photograph was taken uh, the day before yesterday. That is the scene in upstate New York, folks. Don't go there. Uh, <laughs> But what I was interested in, since I had nothing better to do than stand at the window <laughs> uh, and take this photograph, is, is that in, in the smaller American city, there is a commonality. Uh, no trees, very dead buildings. Bit of interest there, bit of interest off the picture. One beautiful Art Deco building which they light up at night. But generally, it's bulk. And I realize that emotionally and culturally, um, oh, what am I doing here? It seems to be going off it. It's telling me the lecture's gone on too long. But emotionally uh, and experientially and architecturally, I realize when I see this where I'm coming from and where I don't want to go in every sense. There are places that have a tremendous kind of resonance or situations. I am in great admiration for what the Scandics did 100 years ago with very little light but cheap electricity. They made lanterns. And so I borrowed and made lanterns too. I realized that the grain of a city is not necessarily something that you have to respect by reproducing it, but maybe you respect some of its intricacy. I'm not sure. I found Graz, which I already knew but long before this building, I found it also in a funny way like Norwich. In fact, I once set a project with my students at the Bartlett to visit both Graz and Norwich and to do then a series of projects that related to one or other of the towns. I think most of them who were Chinese anyhow couldn't figure out, <laughs> I thought both of them were rather strange. But to me, there was a lot to be said between the two. Large universities, industry off the picture, long histories, castles on tops of hills, river going through, you know, lots and lots and lots and lots of things. But uh, it's, it's to the concept. And of course the other thing is that there are bits, even of the context, that. Only when you've taken the photograph afterwards do you realize that that weird shit is existing always off the picture of all the expensive photographers who have taken pictures of this building. The pictures always stop there or look from above. But actually, that's going on underneath, which I've only just realized. And anyhow, what I bang on about is the discovery of interstitial space after the event, and perhaps it is that qualities, the quality of interstitial space and ambiguous 
uh, infestation of the interstitial space, that is to say by vegetation, by strange combinations of geometry, etc., 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 by time, that is something that one is respecting more. Though in the case of Graz, there was already a lot of very good experimental building. This is a, a, a little piece of Volker Ginka's uh, palm house, which was built before our building. And is, 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 you know, it, was a, it was like almost a come on. You, you guys do better. Or there are buildings which look incredibly unprepossessing from the outside. Yell, when I took her first here after banging on about the building for great, said, Why have you brought me here? Till we went inside. We saw that Sigurd Leverance had contrived to have undulating floors, an extremely strange catchment of light, albeit in the gloomy Nordic, uh, the gloomy Swedish. Scenery. It's again one of those buildings. No photo. It's a very difficult photo, a very difficult building to photograph. No photograph does it justice. You just have to bloody go there. There's no way around. It's about an hour and a half from Copenhagen Airport. If, if anybody's that energetic. Or strange things, which again you have to go there to get the audacity of it. In the English tradition. There were people with pump, money, power, and influence who could trap a whole piece of countryside, control it, impose a geometry upon it, impose artificial, strange architecture upon it because they owned it. They owned everything in sight. And I think that is a whole study in itself. And you go there, when you go there, you realize the vastness of it. You realize it's true audacity, whereas if you just see a photograph and a diagram, you say, oh, yeah, very nice way of lining up the thing, and there's a decoy there, and there's a bit of lake there, very nice, yes, lovely. You go there, and you realize it is an experiential theater. What I really realize is that, that my great love in architecture is its, its condition of theater, or of phenomena of what you discover in the foreground the vegetation is tailored, is controlled by man, totally. In the middle ground, the trees are placed, not quite as in control, but their placement is deliberate. Spookily, just about visible in the, in the, in the mist, is a forest or something almost out of control. These conditions of distance control, degree of control, are also, in a sense, theatrical. Uh, in a certain moment in the early morning, the light is peculiar, and we look out of our main room window. Uh, this is winter. In the summer, it's full of trees. This is my construction playing the gazebo game, I guess. This is a construction made 100 years ago of a series of these turrets sort of running along down the street, which were markers. Used by developers' architects in the years 1900 to 1910 of theatrical quotational architecture. Uh, and it gives it, in this light, also a sort of buzz. It's not quite looking out at Norwich, but it's the London version of the next, it's a sort of developer's London version, 100 years ago, the next best thing. It is in the tradition of the picturesque. And finally, a picture I took this morning with the little camera, because we often hear about Nishizawa's famous lady partner, but we don't hear much about him. Now, I know there is a long, and one celebrates the fact that some of the most splendid architects now are female architects. They're allowed to be more famous than the men, finally. But just occasionally, we've got the reverse situation. The guy who is in the shadow of the more famous lady. I haven't been there. Maybe it's grotty when you get there. But it looks pretty interesting to me. And I think you have to carry that with you. Don't ever, and, and I was only reading the architectural review in the plane. I had got the new copy, stuck it in my briefcase, sitting somewhere over Newfoundland or wherever the hell the plane was. Huh. 
And she's always quite interesting. You have to follow your own nose. Never be, never dismiss. Sometimes the person you don't expect to be interesting might even be more interesting than the person who everybody says is interesting. That is the same way as looking out of the car window. Somebody's talking about the building in front of you. But what's that on the hill? Who's this guy? What's that? What's that out the back? OK, I'll spend another half hour in the shower. I've just discovered roof lights for the first time. That, I don't know what that is, whether that is method. I said procedures, whether these are procedures or just me burbling on about what I enjoy. But why not burble on about what you enjoy? There are a lot of people around who burble on about things that they think they ought to be enjoying. Columbia students, please note. Okay. That's it. <laughs> <laughs>